Hello, and welcome to Unsheathed with your hosts, Kyle Gold and Cam Hirosaki. We hope that you enjoy the program. Please stick around afterwards. There'll be cake and blowjobs. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to Unsheathed Live number six. Is that right? You keep better track than no, I No, we're at number seven. Oh, it's seven. Yeah. All right. Welcome to Unsheathed Live number seven. We are here once again during Monday Night Football to give you distracted uh, advice about writing. Yes. <laughs> Although it's actually almost halftime, so we won't be distracted for too much longer. Well, halftime's all the highlights, and I didn't actually get to see any of the games this weekend because I was up at uh, Con. It was weird. Like The games that you thought would be interesting weren't, and the games that you wouldn't think would be interesting were. Actually, in, in the airport today, I saw a highlight of a Percy Harvin touchdown that was pretty amazing. Oh, I don't think I saw that one. Um, and it's not like it's a long touchdown run. It's like 15 yards, maybe. But he goes through about 12 defenders, which is funny because you're only allowed 11. Um, yeah. But no, you'll see what I mean when they show the highlight. Um, so I'm back literally as of about two and a half hours ago oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, from, uh, from Gay Laxicon in Minneapolis, which was a, an outstanding time. And uh, one of the things that I think it has inspired me to do going forward is try to encourage more gay furries to get in touch with the gay science fiction community because they're they're open to furries and they have a lot of they they do a lot of stuff that you know just from being part of a gay community or you know the gay spec fit community um it would be cool to have some overlap and I'm not saying you know abandon the furry fandom and join the Galaxians or whatever they I guess group. that's what they would be called. called them. I, well, I think that the people who put on the, the Minneapolis one are call themselves the North Country Galaxians. Okay. As um, opposed to the North Country Galligans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great muzzle joke. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, but um, but I guess just to the just to the extent that, you know, maybe check out a Galaxicon if there's one in your area. Uh, the next one's going to be in Atlanta, and I know we have a big furry contingent in Atlanta, so it would be great to see those guys out there. Um, I do not know if I'll be able to make it out, because we've already committed to going to FWA, and I think my quota for Atlanta visits in a year is one. <laughs> uh, also, Kit and I are seriously, no for real this time, going to try to travel less next year. We've been saying that for the past two years, and this year we're... Um, we did Seattle last weekend and Minneapolis this past weekend, and we're going to Oklahoma in about eight days. So, and then coming back for a month and going to Australia. So the whole travel less thing didn't really work out for us this year. So I, I've written out a whole big con report for the weekend, but it was uh, it was in general it was a really good time. Um, the uh, Dimby who's in the the chat right now was there. We had a good chat with him and his partner Donovan last night. Uh, he actually helped. He was, uh, Donovan was was probably the guy who made most of this happen, uh, at least for me. Um, Don was the chair, uh, but Donovan I think was the one who arranged my invitation, and you know, so Don put on the show. But uh, anyway, so Dimby also helped quite a bit. Oh, cool. Um, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, the, the panel topics are much more similar to um, a more traditional science fiction convention than they are to a furry con. At furry con, the writing panels tend to shade more towards instructional, like because there's a lot of people who want to know, you know, how do you just right. write a novel? How do you write character? Um, the topics the, that I was on panels on here were things like uh, writing across different fandoms and hmm. writing diversity in science fiction and werewolves and sexual identity. So it was more sort of topics of interest if, uh, for things you're writing about. And uh, I think one of my goals is I'd like to bring a few, a few panels like that. I don't want to abandon the instructional ones because I think I mean, they're obviously still well attended and there's a lot yeah. of people who want to know those things. But maybe bring one or two panels like that in. And I think there's things that you and I could talk about that would yeah. definitely be, no, absolutely. be of interest. Have I told you my idea about the how to be a good pa or how to be a good panel attendee panel? Yes, I do think that would actually probably be a good idea. There was um, a, there was one guy at this con who, in two separate panels of mine, received a phone call 
and answered the phone call and said, I can't talk, I'm in a panel, loudly enough that we could hear it. Um, but, I mean, I think, you know, to his credit, he was trying not to take the phone call, but anyway. Uh, yeah, and uh, what was it? I think it was Earth Digger who mentioned uh, he appreciates when people ask questions that aren't, here's an excuse for me to tell you all about my story, which is something that actually, I hadn't heard it articulated like that before, but I think a lot of times the questions people ask do boil down to that, or it's like, I have a, a nominal question here, but at the same time, like, it, you know, 80% of my question asking is going to be taken up by, like, trying to wow you with this amazing idea behind what I'm writing. God, I remember a panel I did um, years and years and years ago about, uh, I forget what it was, but it was about characters, and um, somebody asked, somebody was like, so I have this story with an invincible protagonist, and I'm trying to figure out how to make him interesting. And like, it basically asked us, how can you fix this problem in my story? I'm going to try don't, to... Don't do what you did. Yeah, don't do you, that. You have done a bad thing. And it was kind of funny because when we did the werewolf panel, a lot of the questions were more people saying, hey, I know this cool thing about werewolves also. and, and but, they, but they didn't pretend that it was, um, that it was something other than, than what it is. Yeah. Though now I'm also having issues with... Oh, well, I want to say issues. One of the things... So this happened a lot at... Rainforest, and I think it happened to you too, where some of our co-panelists would start the panel by saying, I'm underqualified to be on here with these guys, so just listen to them and I'm not going to talk much. Yeah, that happened. I got from a few people. That happened at Rainforest, yeah, a couple times. It's one of those things where it's like, well, first, don't don't say that to the crowd. I mean, that, that's not a good way to instill confidence in people, but um, if there's one thing that being in writing workshops has taught me, it's that you know, perspectives are valuable, and very few people that you run into at, like, a convention circuit of panels, you know, you're not going to have a whole bunch of, like, uber experts anyway. No, and and honestly, you're probably still more qualified than most of the people in the audience, so that's fine. I mean, one of the things that I, I learned a long time ago at a job was... Act like, uh, basically my, my boss told, I was like, I don't know if I can do this job. And she said, fake it till you make it. And really, don't pretend to have knowledge you don't have or experience you don't have. But you're on the panel for a reason. I mean, either if you volunteered to be up there. like, um, So one of the panels I was on was and at Rainforest was collaboration and writing. And I was up there with... Uh, Elizabeth Ann Scarborough, and we introduced ourselves, and I said, you know, I've written a bunch of books, I've done a couple little collaboration projects with people that haven't really gotten published, and she said, I've written 16 novels with Anne McCaffrey. Yeah, like... And, you know, my reaction to that was, cool, I'm going to get to hear a lot of your stories. And the only difference that it made, well, I didn't sit there and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not qualified to be on this panel with you, even though she clearly had more experience in collaboration than I did. Right. But a lot of the questions were, how would you handle it if this situation came up? And I've done enough professional writing to, you know, have an idea of how that would go. Um, she has direct experience, but, you know, then again, she only has direct experience with really one person, and who knows? So, if if the topic panel, if the panel topic were, um, <laughs> you know. Collaboration with Anne McCaffrey. <laughs> yeah, like, haha! I'm amused because the Chiefs are probably going to start Brady Quinn next week. Oh no! And Brady Quinn always just makes me giggle because I'm a mean person. <laughs> this is how like we could like filter out like casual football fans versus like people who actually follow football. Like, it actually it's even funnier if when you hear the name Brady Quinn and your first reaction is who? This <laughs> is part of what makes me giggle. Oh Brady Quinn. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, this Sorry, is... Sorry, so that was a thing. Anyway, uh, Galacticon had... So let me see. I, I have a, a long con report. It's like short story length, like 2,500 words or something. So it's broken into pieces. Like a billion D pages. And I will be, I'll be posting it piecemeal over the next week. Uh, and then I will be posting my Rainforest con report, which I didn't have time to do because I got back and two days later I had to leave. So, um, but in, in brief, uh, it was a lot of fun. A ton of people, like I said, everybody came up and wanted to know, so, you know, what's the deal with furries and, and blah. And actually, um, uh, I have to, I actually have to show you this. Oh God, I'm afraid. Are you, <laughs> so, doing, are we going to do this on the air? No, um, uh, maybe, I guess I could, um, it basically, so I was doing my, I was doing my slash reading. This is something that is not in my con report. <laughs> um, I was doing, I was doing my slash reading and, uh, I mean the slash reading is the story of the slash reading is because it was really an amazingly fun time. Um, what happened in brief was, uh, Lada Morehouse was at Worldcon and I met her and we were talking about stuff and she had done a reading and she said something about, Oh, you should see, you should have seen my slash reading. It, I was so embarrassed. I had to have members of the audience say particular words because, um, I was too embarrassed to say them, but I'd really love to do a midnight slash reading at Galaxicon. And I said, great, I would love to do one too. And she said, done, we'll ask about it. Only it didn't occur to me until like after I'd already committed to doing it that, uh, I didn't know what, fanfic slash I actually had written except for the lunatics slash so dun, dun, dun. and the past comes back to haunt you yeah as so it I, so often does so so I so I played it up because I told her you know I'm writing I'm reading Coyote Roadrunner slash and um and so she was and then she got very worried and she was like I have these two stories and I don't know which one I should read one of them is more one of them is more erotic and one's less erotic one's kind of funny but one's kind of sweet and I was like, I don't know. And she's like, how erotic is yours? I was like, I don't know what standard I'm judging these by. Yeah. Uh, I think it's pretty erotic. If I showed you the sites where our people post our erotica, I would say, by comparison, not very. Not very, <laughs> yes. But by comparison to probably everything else in the world, pretty much. Yeah. So um, it ended up working out. But anyway, so I had to... Um, uh, part of me wants to be mean and like load up a website and like just start reading out titles of stories but that would be uncharitable welcome to a website um so anyway i had to i had to introduce people to the concepts of the lunatics um for which i brought visual aids oh did you really i, I printed out pictures of tech and rev ah uh, and told people about the show did you um, show them the anime <laughs> if you have them in winking I, I showed um, I showed Lida and somebody else afterwards. I did, and I'm like, that is from the show. Yeah. I just put the little caption under it. But um, and I told them about the episode where Rev gets tech to go meet his family. Oh god! And I honestly, I tried to go find that episode uh -huh. so I could show people at the panel before it came uh -huh. on. And watching, I couldn't I couldn't make myself watch enough of that episode to find the part where that happens. Wow. I was Is just it really like, that bad? Oh, my God. Like, I remember it getting bad, but... Um, oh, my yeah. God. It is it is terrible. Um, anyway. The, so, what I told people several times over the weekend is, the first season was so bad, it made me want to write better stories for the characters. And the second season was so bad, it made me stop. <laughs> but anyway, the other thing I had to introduce people to the concept of it panel was, because there's a lot of non-furries there... I had to explain to them why I've used the word sheath. Oh, Jesus. And why... Yeah, I, I have to realize that that's a word that most people don't realize is dirty for no. us. And in, and in Lida, Lida had written Bleach fan fiction, and in... Oh, yeah, they all have their swords. And in her Bleach fan fiction, which, by the way, was not erotic by our standards at all, it was sensual, but, there, like, nothing explicit happened. She left the explicit parts online, so... But in the first story... Like so, the one girl in our class who wrote Queer's Folk Ethic. Yes, my God. But, um, so she had brought two stories. So what we decided was, my story was 4,500 words, and hers were like 2,000 and 3,000. So she read her short one, and then I read mine, and then she read her other one. But in the short one, what happens is, the captain uh, summons the soldier and has him take off his shirt so that he can see his tattoos, and 
the uh, the soldier's undressing, and of course he has to take his sword off. And she says the line, his hand lingered a moment longer on the sheath than it had to, or something like that. <laughs> Literally something like that. And like me and about four or five people in the audience just all went... <laughs> <laughs> Why are the furries suddenly all giggling? And I said, um, so I said, there, you know, there's one other thing I have, to, I have to explain about a word I'm using and why all of us giggled at a certain point in your story. And she was like, oh. <laughs> Letting your fingers linger on the sheath is very necessary. <laughs> well, yes. So anyway, I, I mentioned that. And I searched my story for the word not, but not didn't come up. But then because I mentioned it, it had to be explained anyway. So um, after the reading, uh, and then also I had to explain why Rev Runner has like, humanish kind of uh, genital, like why he has a cock, because otherwise I wouldn't want to write the story. Yeah, because otherwise it would be gross. And uh, and that prompted someone in the audience to hold up a picture of a bird penis, and then... Of course uh, it did. And then, and and I think that same person to ask the, the question that said, you seem to be very familiar with canid genitalia. <laughs> and I was like, in an academic sense, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amused that they knew to use the word canid. So anyway, Hate Fox sent me this or tweeted this. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus! Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Holy crap! You yeah. So basically, the text says at the top, "Oh, you're a furry. Please tell me everything there is to know about animal dicks." <laughs> anyway, um, so that was that was amusing. That's not in my con report. That is an exclusive podcast story. Um, but the slash reading was immense fun, mostly because Lida was super, super embarrassed about reading her stuff because of the attachment to the characters. Like, you know all these characters, and you're like, I've written them doing these other things, even though, you know, there's no cock in any of her stories. And then I was reading, I was looking at mine, and the opening paragraph of mine is basically introducing the whole superhero team, which is really funny in a fanfic, because I'm like... If you're not already familiar yeah. with the series, why are you reading this story? Right. So, but I wrote it as though I'm introducing new people to this, um, which it turned out actually was good. Uh, but it was still. But then I was looking at it and I'm like, oh my god, I don't know if I can read this. And I got super embarrassed. And then she was sitting back and being like, "Go on, go on, it's easy." Um, and uh, apparently, so Kit has. Uh, oh, and there it has been linked to. <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Oh hey, thanks Donovan. Yeah, Donovan's there too. Woo! Yes. Well, you're all you're all like, what's what do you call it being poppy for outside of the fandom? I uh, I don't know. Although actually, uh, actually Donovan and, and Dimmy told us last, or Dimmy told us that he would not mind seeing the term poppy fur go away, and so I told him I prefer to be called to be use uh, fur famous. Fur famous. Yeah, nobody says that though. I mean, no, you did just. That's now, why I like it, but. I'm I'm not a huge fan of poppy fur, but um, yeah, I think because it, like it sounds so malicious. Well, it's or sounds, like it sounds weird, and it always makes me think of Wicked. Tippy <laughs> says they don't say it yet. <laughs> That's right. We can start it. It could become a thing. Um, wow, I've taken up a lot of time talking about con stuff. Uh, That's cool. I mean, it's it's a neat, different thing that I don't think a lot of people in the audience would know about. So yeah. I think that's that's justified. So it was uh, so it was cool, and keep an eye out for the con reports. They will be posted. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, so one of the things that came out is apparently in Bleach there's a Kitsune character. Oh, is there? Or a Fox Demon character? Okay. And sorry, Lada... I don't watch weeaboo stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there was the the the, the slash after we'd read the stories there was this whole discussion about why bleach and what may and, and she was like a lot of it is really bad but it sets up this really interesting society with these class differences right. and part of it is like you have a spirit inside that determines some of how you engage with the like it comes out during attacks and so the the, the soldier that she was using has like this snake tiger or something okay. inside him but then the fo- the guy who's a fox on the outside actually seems to have a human spirit on the inside. Okay. And, and so now, like, half the chat room is like, knows exactly who you're talking about. Yes. Anyway, so uh, so uh, Perry, who I think goes by Hate Fox on Twitter, um, told her that... Is it, was it Perry? No, it was uh, Belloa. Okay. So Belloa knows Bleach. 
And so he told oh, her she should do fanfic of this character. And so apparently she stopped him, uh, or she was chatting with him on Sunday and said she's reading some of my stuff to make sure that she gets the, uh, the aspects of her slash fiction correct. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> so that should be entertaining. Um, do you have anything you want to talk about? Do people have, do you want to take some questions? Yeah, let's just take some questions. I don't really have anything major to talk about. I mean, okay. there's rain for us, but we have an episode that we recorded there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking that yeah. too. Um, so, Although, for whatever, if you weren't at Rainforest, for when that episode comes out, we have possibly the best question we've ever been asked. Yeah. So look forward to that. And and best as in, like, really in, engaging in a right yeah. sense, not best as in, oh my god, most entertaining. Yeah, no, like, I, I was thinking about it on the drive over today, actually. Like, it went through my head again. I'm like, man, like, that was a really great discussion. But Buck Turner asks, any thoughts on the recent Petty Arcade comics? Have you not seen them? Uh, I have been sort of off the interweb since, like, Thursday yeah, morning. Yeah, like, once again, we have descended into full-on furry. Oh, God, no, no, no. Yeah. At, at the con, somebody was like, yeah. uh, people were asking us about the Penny Arcade, something about, um, they were like, oh, when the Penny Arcade guys make fun of furry, you just take it in stride. And I was like, we take it in stride because, oh, my God, look at those comics. If you haven't seen the last two Penny Arcade strips... I don't know if it's uh, if it's going to continue, but basically it's about like two soldiers in World War II, and one of them talking to his like fellow soldier about he's a raccoon on the inside, and he has his like sketchbook that he draws in, and like it's actually like one of those things where it's like, okay, seriously, like what are you what are you getting into now? Like it. I, I can't help but think that, like, he's been on the cusp for a long time, and he's about to fall in. Or perhaps has dabbled his toes in more than we think. Yeah, I mean... Right? It, it Yeah, it doesn't... Uh, Part of his Quimbley ringtail? <laughs> I mean, come on, like, that's like, hello, like, late 90s furry fandom, like, where have you been? No, uh, uh, that's... Hey, Tycho, do you have yourself a VCL account? Um, it's, a. Uh... I'm, I'm amused to say that I don't think it really changes my perceptions very much. Um, we kind of we kind of missed the release, and I think we talked about this on an episode. But uh -huh. they put out a new version of their video game in which you can play the characters as furries. Can you really? Yeah. What seriously? Yeah. How did I not hear about this? Uh, I don't know, but they they released uh, when they when they released it for the Mac. Mm -hmm. They include a, a level where you can play the characters as furries. Oh my! See, yeah, like. And wow. I, I was waiting. I was waiting to hear more about it so I could kind of plug it when it came out. And then um, Lovejoy told me, like, "Oh no! In the latest ad for the game, it shows the characters as furries." Oh my god! Like, yeah. And that's... and Tycho, I, I, I was bound by secrecy, but Tycho told us about it at Comic Con, and he was like, "You know, it's it's secret because the game isn't out yet." But he's like, "I was really excited about this. You could play the characters as furries." So yeah, and and it it kind of so makes me, we. He he told us he wanted he was interested in coming to Rainforest. Um, we sent him a couple emails. He never answered. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was just the you know the timing was bad. He, I'm sure he gets a million emails. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the timing was bad. It was busy. He forgot about it. But um, hey, one of these years. Yeah, one of these years. One of these I mean, years, we'll get we're, in there. We're not going anywhere, and it's in, more and more on the show. I would love to have him on the show, actually. More and more, it we. We should. Well, he he was really. I, I asked him if he'd want to be on some panels, and he was like, "No, no, no. I don't want to." Um, uh, what was the word he used? Something like co-opt or assume. He's like, "I want to just be an observer first, because he didn't think he would have." That's anything actually a fair to attitude say. to take. Yeah. No, and his his attitude has all been um, really, the really just very curious. But curious. I, I, and I, I was there a long time ago. Yes. And, uh, but he was real excited. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I feel like it just kind of slipped through, like when he's back in his regular day to day yeah. life, things just get real busy. Um, so yeah, my opinion of the, uh, what, what is in his, uh, his articles that go along with those? Oh, he actually has some pretty insightful blog posts about things like, you know, like gender identity and stuff like that, where, um, you know, like, 
he actually talks about, you know, if, like, you know, his son came home from school and mentioned that he was, like, gay, like, he's like, yeah, like, not, like, a thing, and one of the things, just basically, like, the, you know, the idea of, um, you know, cultural normality and all that, so I think that's actually, I mean, it's, I don't want to summarize the whole thing here, you can just go and read it, um, but, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'd encourage people to go and, and, um, yeah. you know, mention it positively. The, the thing about, the thing about furries is, generally, when people, we, we love to talk about ourselves, and that's something that we told people many times over the weekend, um, because people would ask us, like, if it's not too personal a question, and we're like, oh, please. Yeah. I've been in the furry fandom for, like, ten years. You cannot, I, I guarantee you, you are not coming up with a, an inappropriately personal question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I get inappropriately personal questions from people inside the fandom that you would never think to ask. Yeah. Um, Tell but, me everything there is to know about animal ticks. Yeah, well, um, you seem to know a lot about canid genitalia. You seem yeah. to be very familiar with canid genitalia. Uh, yes, academically. Um, but no, I mean, they're, they're coming down, uh, I think they're coming down for GamerCon next oh, year. Cool. So, nice. potentially... Um, I mean, we can investigate the appropriateness of this, but we could potentially do uh, see if we could do a show there and see if they'd want to be on it. I would be up for that. Um, I'm nominally suited to go to that anyway. You are more than nominally suited. I, I think I'm I directly. Am, <laughs> I am barely nominally suited. Um, I've been trying to up my cred by playing Portal. So Kit, hey, and, I, Kit and I finished Portal Two over the weekend. <laughs> oh. Did you what's like up, it? 2011? Yeah, what's up, 2011? Hey, yo. Um, no, I liked it a lot. I mean, we 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 are big fans of it. Uh, I am a, I am a huge fan of it and to the point where um, I played Team Fortress a little bit with some friends, and I kind of want like a portal version of Team Fortress. Like, I want to be able to do a multiplayer oh, yeah. a multiplayer with portal guns and and whatnot. I think that would be kind of awesome. And. Uh, you know, guns that shoot the different gels, and, uh, anyway. But, uh, so, uh, any other questions? Uh, we're gonna uh, run a little bit over, because I yeah. yapped for, like, 20 minutes. But no, uh, Kazaki asks, uh, do any of us have formal writing training outside of our writing workshop and a mandatory English class or two in college? See, um, that's an interesting question, because it, it... I would count the Stanford classes. Yeah, I, I would, I would say that those count. But um, it, it implies that like there is like a formal training regimen for writers, and there really isn't. No, but I will say, um, probably the single most valuable class we took was that first novel writing, or not that first short story class. The one with Will. With Will. Yeah, no, that was the the takeaway from that one was just I know so much more about how to read and how to give feedback on stories after that class that, you know, if I could ensure that that class was available in every major metropolitan area, I would make anyone who asked me for writing advice go take it. Yeah, and I still recommend the book that we used in that class, the the Modern Writers Workshop, um, to anyone who wants to learn about writing. Uh, yeah, I, I, the I author recommend is, that book up and down. Yeah, the author's name is K-O-C-H. The book is called The Modern Writers Workshop. You can find it on Amazon pretty easy. Um... And, but that one, I mean, we, we took some other formal classes. We took screenplay class, which was also pretty valuable because mm -hmm. it taught you how to think about plot. And if you're kind of, if you're stuck, like if a book isn't moving the way you want it to, how to sort of maybe diagnose what might be a problem. The, um, like this, this out of position three does not, I think, follow this, the three act structure very well, mainly because it's, Mostly like Act One and part of Act Two, but uh, but I don't think it needs to. But yeah, it but it doesn't need to. And with it's, novels, well, you have more flexibility. Yeah. And also with that, since it's the third novel in a series, the the structure is supported by back weight that the reader already has on the characters, so you don't need to spend as much time going through all that and yada yada yada. Right. It's so facto, like kind of thing. <laughs> QED. Yes. Vis a vis. Um, Concordantly. But, but the three-act structure is very useful. So, sort of, to answer your question, yes, we have. Um, but, and, you know, honestly, there was an article posted a while back about how to get um, get your 
get your own, you know, do your own MFA kind of thing, uh, rather than paying money for a two-year MFA program or yeah. going to, you know, a, a formal school. And basically it was like, read a lot of stuff, learn how to write critically, or learn how to read critically, uh, learn how to critique other things, and learn how to apply the critiques to your own writing. Um, and, you know, uh, Cam and I have done, I think there were five points of stuff you should do on your own, and Cam and I had done, like, I think four of them. I think the only one we hadn't done specifically was, you know, go back and read a lot of great works of yeah. literature. But um, but really, uh, if, if you can get exposure to a, a critique group in a... Um, in a formal setting like a, you know, uh, evening class, uh, continuing education kind of thing, or if you're still in college, you know, take a, a creative writing class where specifically they say you will critique other student works. Um, they will teach you a lot of invaluable techniques to um, learning to read more critically and learning to critique better. The other writing class that we got a lot out of was, um, at least I did, was the, um, was, the fa was it called Fabulous Fiction? The one that... Uh, that Chelsea. Yes, yeah. with Chelsea, who was great. Yes. And, and also gay. Um, yes. But, uh, no, because um, that introduced me to a lot of great writers uh, that I had never heard of before. Uh, that was also the class that... that uh, told us about Cloud Atlas before we told you all about it 87 times. Yep, actually, that is, and, that uh, is it. That's true. And uh, I actually wrote a story for that class that wound up getting published as a cupcake. So there we go. Um, yeah. And so the, the other thing I'd recommend if you're not taking formal class, or if you don't have like a creative writing class, would be to take a, a survey of, of like modern fiction and just kind of get familiar with some of the writers. One of yeah. the things that I'm still trying to catch up on with a lot of the people that I've been talking to at Gay Lexicon and Worldcon is reading the writers that people that are doing great stuff nowadays. Right. Because um, they're out there. They are. They are. And, you know, one of the uh, one of the finalists for the Hugo this year was called uh, The Cartographer Wasps and the Anarchist Bees. And it could easily have been a furry story. Hmm. I mean, yeah. it was literally about these two colonies, a colony of wasps and a colony of bees. And, huh. um, but I would say, you know, look at the end of year list, look at the nominees for the Hugo, the nominees for the Nebula, the Locust recommended book or stories and books. And, you know, pick up a couple of them, pick up a few, look at the names. And when you see certain names appearing over and over again, um, you know, like, uh, Rachel Sversky is one of the ones who's coming up. Uh, Mary Robinette Kowal had a couple things nominated. Brad Torgerson is is getting a lot of uh, a lot of buzz. Ken Liu, um, Ken Liu had a couple things nominated for Hugo, and of course, you know I'm a huge fan of Kids Johnson because not only does she write amazing things, but she also writes furry things. Um, I'm working my way through her short story collection, which is called At the Mouth of the River of Bees. It is recently out, and you should all go and order it, because it is amazing. Um, anyway. And one last quick question that I think we can answer very briefly. Sure. From Iridescent Dragon. When writing relationships, do your own relationship experiences color your writing? Yes. <laughs> yes. This is most easily manifest in the fact that Kyle tends to write about loving and stable relationships, and I write about relationships that are miserable and broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the short also answer is yes. Jets. Also, hi, Iridescent Dragon. Um, was that a defensive touchdown? Yes, it was. Mm. No, it was a kickoff return. Never mind. Wow, a 100 yard kickoff return. I thought, I thought it was intercepted, but now it actually kicked it off. Um, but, um, I mean, the other, thing, the other thing that colors my relationships is listening to the Dan Savage podcast because. Yeah. You, I mean, those are all real people calling in, saying, and you get the weirdest stories. Um, Drifting was actually inspired by a call into that podcast, and that's weird. I always thought it was inspired by me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was inspired by um, someone called in and basically said, "I love my husband or wife, 
uh, I forget, actually, I forget which it was now. It might have been a woman actually saying, I love my husband and we have a wonderful life together and I don't want to give any of it up, but we have not had sex in like two years. And it's not that I don't want to. It's that I don't, you know, we didn't, for a while we didn't, and then I would kind of approach him and it would get weird, and then I just stopped asking, and, you know, what do I do? And Dan actually says, well, you should talk about it, but there's, you know, there's a belief that, that there's sort of this myth that your partner in a monogamous relationship should be able to satisfy all your sexual needs. And really, if you can get to about like 75%, you're doing pretty good. And you should be happy if you get to a place where you compromise. Like both of you give a little bit up, but you get the other one for life. And that makes up for it. For the, you know, the one or two things that your partner doesn't want to do. Or the fact that you want to have sex five times a week and they only want to have sex twice a week. Um, and those compromises are what relationships are built on. However, if you know, you want to have sex like one time a week and they want to have sex zero <laughs> ever, you have a right to have those needs met some other way. And if you feel like you can discuss it with your partner and say, look, I don't want to impose on you. I don't want to do the, make you do this, these things that you don't want to. I don't want it to be a duty or, you know, cause that's not fun, but I can't just not do, do this. If you feel like you can have that talk and have permission to kind of go out and get your needs met elsewhere, you know, confident that it won't threaten the relationship, mm -hmm. then that's the best way to do it. But if not, if you just have to go out and, you know, then your partner should be willing to turn a blind eye if they un uncover evidence that you're cheating. Um, yeah. Also, as far as experiences with relationships go, that also applies not just to relationships that we've personally been in, but ones that we've seen. Um, I have known people and friends who have been in relationships where things happen where it's like, if I wrote this in a story, people would go like, bullshit. Yeah. That would never happen. Two sane, rational adults would never do that. And I can think of countless examples in, in my real life of things where I could do that. Yeah. Like, um, also, sort of tangential, there's a, there's a good article on adjective species up today about uh, HIV and the furry fandom, which touches on... Apparently that like, really took off, too. Like, yeah. It's gotten a lot of hits. It touches on um, why uh, or some of the peculiarities of the relationships in the fandom. Um, but anyway, it's, it's worth reading, at least. It's generating some strong opinions. Oh, yeah. I think we're pretty good now. Um, most of the people are asking about who Dan Savage is, and that's been all cleared up on the oh, good, podcast good. chat room. Thank you, listeners. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I forget, uh, anyway, you've cleared it all up, so I don't need to say anything. Yeah, no problem. Um, so anyway, in some, Rain First good, Gay Lexicon, Rain First was, was really good, Gay Lexicon was really good, um, I wish, uh, I wish Cam had been able to accompany us out there, but. Yeah, I had stuff to do, though. Um, I'm hoping that maybe some group will bring a Gay Lexicon out to the West Coast. Because it moves around like Worldcon. It basically, okay. if your group wants to hold a Galaxicon, you bid on, you know, holding the convention in your area. Um, and it would be it would be cool to have one out here. I think the last one that was out on the West Coast was in San Diego a while ago. But I think the Bay Area or even like Portland or Seattle would be a great place for one. So yeah. Um, anyway, uh, thanks everyone for stopping by. Yeah. And since people are asking, yes, we are doing regular real episodes again, too. Yes. And we're, we've got a couple in the can. Or yeah, they're just, I think just, I think think just, just the, the rainforest, rainforest one. one. Oh, that's right, because the football and pony show is out again already. Oh, and looks like, no, not quite. Not quite. Not quite touchdown uh, Texans. But, uh, but um, yeah, we are, although my travel schedule is kind of messing some of that up. And then we'll have, when, I, when we get back, I don't know if we're going to do one this weekend. We might. Uh, but then when we get back from Oklahoma, we're here for a month, or I'm here for three weeks, and then you go to MFF. I do go to MFF. And then you get back from MFF, and we go to Australia. And But then we get back, and we're here for the whole holiday season. I don't know. Well, we'll talk about that. But yeah. we'll, we'll have time to do some episodes. And um, 
as long as we don't, as long as we aren't doing like every week. Um, well, probably at least get like one or two a month. Kit seems a little more inclined to to yeah. work them out. So, um, thanks, guys. We will tweet when the next one comes up. And until then, uh, good night. Keep, stay furry. Stay furry. Keep writing. <laughs>